This is a production of Cornell University. That are, that are commercially available and um, a small colony that needs to be redeployed every um, uh, six to eight weeks or so. Um, or you could also use mechanical ventilation. Um, in, in the small scale of research that we have at Cornell, it wasn't practical for us to obtain um, bumblebees. So we actually used a, um, a leaf blower. Um, this was a battery operated leaf blower that was not very powerful or, and we kind of throttled it down. And so once a day we would move through the, the crop and um, try to carefully um, uh, blow the flower clusters to mechanically pollinate them. Um, it was decently effective, um, but we would, we would periodically see misshapen fruit indicating that there was poor pollination of our flowers. So these rows are typically spaced about three feet apart, um, sometimes slightly tighter spacing, 2.6 to, to 3.3 feet apart. Um, and then um, that would give us a plant density of, so if this slab is about three feet long or a meter long and they're spaced a meter apart, we'd have anywhere from eight to 12 plants per square meter or about uh, one plant just under or just over per um, square foot per plant. So some of the, the benefits of growing in uh, greenhouses or high tunnels would be season extension or year round production. Uh, we can have reduced disease and we certainly see this in cases where in a in a high tunnel, for example, we're protecting our plant from, from rainwater um, that, that can damage the, the fruit. It can lead to leaf-borne pathogens. Um, similarly, in a greenhouse, we would have that, that benefit. We can also control the, the relative humidity and the airflow um, to reduce um, those foliar diseases. Um, we can also grow where there's poor soil drainage in, in the underlying field. Um, and then um, there are some really nice gains in labor ergonomics. So we're not um, bending down to work in the, the crop that's um, planted into the ground, but the crop is at waist height or slightly higher. Um, and so it's easier to, to transplant um, and uh, pick fruit, for example, and maintain the crop. And overall, because we're in an environment where we either have some control or, or even more control with, with the temperature and adding supplemental light in some cases, um, we get higher yield and quality than outdoors. Um, some of the some of the cons uh, that we have to think about is um, it is a soilless substrate production requires more precise irrigation and fertilization practices. So this would typically include weekly monitoring um, of the root zone um, pH and and fertility level or electrical conductivity. Um, periodically sending samples to uh, like leaf tissue samples to a lab for analysis to make sure that our fertilizer program is on track. Um, and then uh, periodically monitoring and adjusting the, the amount of irrigation water that we're supplying uh, at each irrigation event. So it also requires more, more time and more money for controlling the environment. Uh, we, we still see a proliferation of insects often. So mites, thrips, um, and aphids. Um, and so then you also have to establish an integrated pest management program. Um, and a lot of times in a greenhouse that would focus on using um, uh, beneficial insects. So good bugs that fight bad bugs, um, as well as there are some examples of, of typically there's there are softer pesticides that are re registered for um, an edible crop in the greenhouse. And we definitely have higher production costs than in a field. Uh, we do have higher output as well. Um, I remember there was a study from, from the University of Arizona that even in, a, in an Arizona greenhouse, which requires a lot less heat and supplemental light than a New York greenhouse, they were looking at input costs of about $4 per pound of strawberries. Um, and so you have to think about how you would differentiate, differentiate your product um, to bring a higher uh, price at market. And some of that could be the off season uh, production, but uh, you would need to produce a high quality flavorful product that's going to um, bring consumers out. Um, just a little bit about cultivars. Typically in high tunnels, we're looking at using um, day neutral cultivars. Um, and a little bit later, I'll show you some specific examples of that. Um, and so we, we use these ever bearing cultivars so that we can take advantage of an extended growing season and we would harvest them over multiple months in the high tunnel. Um, in a greenhouse or vertical farm, 
we can use either day neutral or short day cultivars. So day neutral could give us um, several months of harvesting. Um, for short day plants, um, these could be more productive because they'll give us, you know, a large flush of um, fruit. And so these would be plants that that were grown up ahead of time, kept in coolers until we want to force them or establish them in the, the greenhouse for fruiting. Um, and then we would we would have um, several crop cycles per year. So this would take quite a bit of labor um, to to bring our plants out of the cooler. Um, force them to to fruit um, and let them fruit for for a few months and then take them out again. Um, and so, um, in a in a greenhouse, often our limiting factor for when we can can grow these plants is it's really hard to maintain cool enough conditions in the summertime. Depending on on your climate, New York has has different climates. Um, but if we have high night temperatures, so night temperatures above about um, if they're higher than the low 60s. Uh, we get poorer berry production and we get poorer um, fruit quality. So the, the fruit are not as um, uh, sweet. Uh, and with our cultivar selection, we have to consider again that market differentiation. So choosing cultivars that have um, good flavor and quality. Just a little bit about the environmental conditions. So we're looking at uh, day temperatures of 68 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideal night temperatures are quite cool. Uh, 50 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, those lower temperatures give us larger fruit size and better um, flavor and sweetness of berries. Um, and then above 60 to 65 um, leads to higher acidity levels. So we get uh, uh, more acidic fruit. Uh, the optimum light that we would get is, is um, fairly moderate kind of sunlight conditions. Um, and if, you, if we talk about light um, in moles per meter squared per day, um, we'd be in between a, a lettuce plant and a tomato plant, for example. So lettuce would have about 15 moles of light per day. Tomatoes would have about 30 moles of light per day. Um, and so we would want 20 to 25, which means in the winter time, if we want uh, good output from our crop, we would definitely have to use supplemental lighting. Um, similarly, many greenhouse growers in the, the winter time um, would enrich with carbon dioxide to make uh, to improve crop productivity. So CO2 feeds into photosynthesis and that improves our crop yield by uh, maybe 20 to 30 percent. Um, and then humidity is uh, 40 to 60 percent during the day. And then during the night, we actually want to have high humidity. And I'll explain that for a minute. So three hours at 95 percent humidity at night. So a typical greenhouse production schedule would have us uh, say transplanting um, well-developed um, tray plants. Um, so plants that were previously propagated um, about two to, to two and a half months before. Um, they're transplanted, flowering begins in September through October, and then we're harvesting our plants uh, November through May with the harvest ending when, when temperatures get too warm in the greenhouse. Um, and one of the bottlenecks that I'm hearing about from, from greenhouse strawberry growers is it's hard to source good um, tray plants from um, propagators. So many growers will do their own propagation in the summertime where they'll take runner tips and root them and then grow them on in 125 to 250 milliliter pots. Um, just a few photos um, from uh, greenhouse strawberry production. These are, these are plants that are getting um, established. In this case, the, um, the plastic is used to help prevent um, uh, weeds that could, that could proliferate in the soilless substrate. Um, as well, it could help with some insects, so like thrips, for example, or fungus gnats. So, so thrips are on the leaves, but then um, they actually pupate in the soil, and so they drop down um, and pupate in the soil, so that can help restrict them. Um, here's a view of um, this greenhouse did not have supplemental lighting, um, but they did have photoperiodic lighting. So to, to trick the plant into thinking that it's getting long days, which helps um, with, with initiating more flowers and more fruit, they actually had these, um, these LED lights that have some, some far red light. Um, and those would be operated um, four hours per day during the middle of the night. And here's plants that are coming into to fruiting and being actively harvested at this point. Um, and in Japan, their market's quite interesting. These berries were selling for about a dollar per berry, and every 
every berry was, was high quality um, and kind of packed um, individually. A little bit about yields um, for, for field production. Um, in California, we get about 60,000 pounds per acre per year. Of course, they have this would be day neutral strawberry production over several months um, per year. So that gives us about 1.4 pounds of fruit uh, per year. Our New York field production um, is seasonal and then much lower yield. So 5,000 to 20,000 pounds per acre per year. Um, so there are reports that high tunnel tabletop yields can be double outdoors. I would say that would be like double New York uh, style yields. Um, and in the greenhouse, uh, we can get uh, maybe two to 2.6 pounds of uh, fruit per square foot per year. Um, a high-tech greenhouse in the Netherlands that would be operating year round could get up to 4.5 pounds of fruit per square foot per year. So in the end, quite high yields, maybe about three times the um, California yields and nine, nine times more than New York field yields. Um, just a bit about a couple of common disorders. So I mentioned that we need to maintain high humidity for a few hours at night. Um, this is to avoid um, strawberry tip burn. Strawberry tip burn is a calcium deficiency um, that's kind of akin to lettuce tip burn. Um, and this is where the developing um, tissues, the leaves and the, and the bracts, um, a few weeks before the symptoms show up, like this picture on the right, um, there, was, there was poor calcium supply to the developing tissues. Um, and calcium supply in strawberries um, uh, relies a lot on having positive root pressure at night. So um, if you've ever seen gatation on strawberries, maybe in your like outdoor strawberries, um, in the morning where there's there's actually water leaking through the the vessels on the out of the out or edges of the leaf um, that's showing us that there was positive root pressure at night um, so instead of water being pulled through through transpiration um, a positive root pressure built up and and water was pushed through the plant to deliver calcium um, and so so for strawberries that's that's a good sign we need that that to help deliver calcium to the plant to avoid um, tip burn which can um, impair our leaf productivity. It can also make um, fruit unsightly if the, if the um, sepals have um, this tip burn as well. So um, common pests and diseases are aphids, spider mites, and thrips. Here are thrips feeding in the flowers, which they love feeding on pollen. Um, common diseases would be uh, powdery mildew and botrytis. Um, and so here's, here's botrytis, for example. Um, gray mold that's on that's on fruit. One of the control mechanisms that we have there is to remove any decaying tissue or dying tissue, including any like overmature fruit that was not previously harvested. Um, at uh, Cornell, one of our earlier greenhouse research projects was to screen um, a few different cultivars of strawberries. Um, and these were all day neutral <clears throat> strawberries. So Albion, Cabrillo, Seascape, and Portola um, were used in the study. And uh, we looked at um, the bricks or the sugar content of berry. We also looked at, at yields. Um, and so this was over a, a um, six month period um, in the winter time. Um, and Albion um, gave us our lowest yields. We could actually get almost twice the yields with cultivars, Cabrillo, and 50% higher yields with Portola. Uh, but one of the things that we found uh, and is well known with Albion is it's a very sweet berry. Um, and so it's still one of the, Albion would be probably the most common greenhouse strawberry varieties that are used um, because of its um, sweetness. Um, so we have to think about that market differentiation again. Could we, could we double our yield, but have a, a less sweet berry and would the consumer be okay with that? So I'll uh, conclude with just uh, a couple trends that we're seeing for CA strawberries. Um, so um, two thirds of the strawberry production area in the UK is in soilless substrates. So it's largely moved away from, from field soils um, because of the control that you get. Um, in the Netherlands, there's 815 acres of strawberry production under glass. Um, so, so a large share of their crop um, in 
North America and the US, we're just starting to see increased interest in greenhouse strawberry production. So New York, we have Green Empire Farms, which is 32 acres of greenhouse strawberry production. Um, in California, we have 90 acres of tabletop production. This would be um, outdoors, but in soilless substrates. Um, and in Canada, we have a, a couple large farms now with, with greenhouse strawberries. And then we're seeing vertical farms too. So I thought this was interesting. Um, Oishi is a vertical farm company based out of New Jersey, and they sell, they sell um, strawberries to high-end markets. Um, this, this box with 11 strawberries actually sells for $50. Um, so, so imagine paying five dollars per strawberry. Um, so people are really captivated by this fruit and they'll, they'll sell them to kind of top restaurants and high-end consumers that maybe want to impress their loved one with, with very tasty strawberries. So maybe that's something we could aspire to um, as well and I think we could do it for much much cheaper in a, in a greenhouse or high tunnel. With that, I will stop. And I think I've used up any time I had for questions, but I'm happy to um, sit and monitor the chat and I'll be responding during the session this morning. Um, so moving right along, our next presenter is Kathy Dem Demchek. Many of you know Kathy. She has a, a, been a longtime supporter of berry um, production research and extension efforts in the Northeast. Um, she's a senior extension associate at the Penn State University where her responsibilities are to conduct applied research into technologies that improve the sustainability of berry production with the overall goal of reducing negative environmental impacts of production while maximizing crop productivity. So Kathy, if you wanna share your screen, and um, take it away. Okay, so um, so we've been doing some work um, in containerized production of strawberries um, and and um, raspberries for for a few few years now. Um, we had been dabbling with it earlier, so I'm going to give a little history and talk a little bit about where we've ended up um, and what conclusions we have so far, and then um, primarily concentrate on some of the pests. So even though, you know, as Neil mentioned, a lot of the work seems to be, you know, increasing recently, um, you know, these are some systems, um, different soil systems that growers have been trying off and on for, for over 20 years now in the Northeast. And sometimes it's gone okay. Sometimes there have been, um, you know, they've given up and, and moved on to other things. Um, now there's something called the Ibex growing system that some folks are trying. Um, again, it's a lot like some of the other, other systems. Um, and then, of course, there are gutters um, that people have tried over time. We've had some growers try like Seascape and Mara de Bois. Um, so, but over this time as this has been happening, it was a, you know, small percentage of the production, um, but a lot of the questions I was getting. And, and so, you know, just my point in all of this is that, you know, I'm glad we're I'm working out some of these things maybe because there does seem to be a long term need for info looking both backwards and forwards. Um, I do want to credit, you know, some of the work that had happened to before, before I, you know, I started working on anything for sure. Um, there used to be some information in the um, NRA Strawberry Guide back in 1998 about greenhouse production. Um, Cornell had done some work on greenhouse raspberry production. And so some of this earlier work that was done really laid the, um, the groundwork for us to move forward. Um, over on the left, um, you see a photo of a young Fumi Takeda. Fumi had retired at um, the end of, um, towards the end of last year. Um, and then over on the right are some gutters we had had back in uh, 2003 and 2004 um, in our Penn State High Tunnel Complex, which the Lamont and Mike Gorzlick have been very instrumental in getting going. So I wanna thank all those folks for, for their help over the years. So more recently, um, there has been, you know, it, the greenhouse interest, the controlled environment um, interest um, with, with Dr. Kubota, um, now out at Ohio State, formerly Arizona, um, the information Neil had presented. And then as he mentioned, um, the commercial operations are, are increasing or beginning to increase in, in number and size. Neil had mentioned some of the um, protected culture um, advantages. And so I don't really, 
um, need to go over those so much, but I do want to point out, you know, one that growers had mentioned um, that is part of the better quality is just the more attractive appearance of the fruit. And as we know, you know, consumers, as, as folks will say, buy with their eyes. And so having those nice looking berries is important for marketability. Um, that is something that, um, you know, growers have mentioned to me. And then re regarding labor, there is the improved organ ergonomics if you have the system up off of the ground. But the other thing is that um, if you have folks working for you, you, there is the predictability of when they can work. And so even if you're working in high tunnels, it doesn't matter if it's a rainy day, um, they you can still plan on harvesting on a schedule or whatever you want to do. Um, in that in that tunnel. So the way we got into this in a bigger way um, was um, there was a multi-state SCRI project looking at plastic covers on high tunnels um, for high tunnels um, that was led by Eric Hansen out at Michigan State. Cornell was a part of it. Um, folks at, in New Hampshire and Vermont um, and um, also some other states. We had some co collaborators in the UK who were a big help. So we had a part where we were looking at the different um, plastic covers on the tunnels. And the problem was we had a lot of variation in soil between the tunnels. So varying in pH and nutrient concentration or content. And so we wanted to um, get away from that. And so, um, and we were also growing both raspberries and strawberries as part of the research we were doing. And so we needed to take, um, decided we needed to move to containers but we also needed to um, be on the um, same irrigation setup for both crops. And so we had to find a system that we could use um, also that students who were working with us could help with um, on fairly, you know, with only a little bit of training um, or that, you know, we felt would function well over, over a weekend without running into problems. And so we were going for about the most low tech system we could possibly go for while still growing um, in a soilless media and containers. And so, um, okay, and now for some reason, my screen does not want to advance. So why is this? Hmm. Well, that is a an interesting little predicament to have. Um, did, you try, <laughs> Kathy, did you try the regular advance? There's a there's the little ones down in the left hand corner, and then sometimes if you do your own um, on your your um, you know your little forward arrows. Yes. Yes. None of that is doing it. Well, those are not showing up at the bottom, unfortunately. So I might have to escape out of this and get back to it. I have never had this happen. Well, hmm. all right. Well, let me just um, see if I can. I'm going to just start sharing. Oh, yeah, I'm still sharing, but I'm going to just try advancing here. I don't know. Maybe I'm just stuck on that one and see if we can go forward from here. And if not, well, we'll try something else. <laughs> so anyway, so we had to figure the system out pretty quickly. Um, and so, um, you know, that expression necessity is the mother of invention. So, so we um, basically, um, you know, we talked to a lot of folks. So we talked to Eric out at, out at Michigan State um, and, you know, took a look at the work um, other folks had done before us. Um, and then we did a quick winter trial to try out some different things where we basically just tried a whole bunch of stuff over a winter um, and we did find something that would work fairly, fairly well for us. And what this was, um, which we're not really, you know, wholesale recommending right now, but it worked well in our situation was a, a two to one peat perlite mix that we had to mix ourselves. It did not have lime added to it because we have high bicarbonate waters and we didn't want to get into having to acidify. Um, the water source um, with the setup we had, and fortunately, um, this seemed to work fairly well. So you can see our raspberries. Um, this is the variety polka in the front, um, and Josephine in the back. These were actually two separate trials that were happening um, at this particular time. And then down in, in the right, um, you see um, one of our tunnels where we had Albion. Uh, Sweet Anne, Cabrillo, um, and San Andreas growing, you can see right there. So, 
So anyhow, um, so so we worked out something enough for that trial to be able to manage, um, and now we're um, continuing to look at some some things. Um, and again, um, we're just trying to find a way of growing the plants that you know almost anybody could adopt who has a high tunnel um, and doesn't have a real strong background um, in greenhouse production. So, um, so anyway, so we tried some things out last year where we knew we were doing things the wrong way. And long story short, um, we figured out all sorts of way to make, <laughs> ways to make iron deficient. And so um, my, my approach is sometimes that I need to make mistakes before I can figure out how to fix them. And so that's, that's where we were on that one. So anyhow, so we're still working it all out. Um, there's a lot of potential, I think, with strawberries. Um, you know, there are interactions between the media type you're using, um, the water source and the fertilizer you're using. So we're trying to, you know, work some of that out. Um, our conclusion we're coming to is it probably isn't like a one size fits all approach that'll work for everybody. But there may be some um, some ways of doing this that you know. Say if you're in a situation with a high bicarbonate water, then you do this, or if you're not, then you do something different. But um, we're still working that out. But um, some of the overall keys I think we've come up with is, and which I think everybody else would agree with, is that you do need a um, a lower pH media. Um, so you know, talking down in the range of mid mid fives to maybe six seems to help out. Um, if you have a high bicarbonate water, um, acidifying the water source, or if you start out with good water quality, that's good. Um, micronutrients can be an issue, and then we kind of found that raspberries were a relative breeze compared to strawberries. So we're going to keep working on all that. Um, I do want to um, just throw up this quote. This is what um, Laura had said that today's talk would be about. And so I'm going to spend the rest of the talk um, talking about some of the pests we've seen in our trials and what we've done to, to manage those. Um, most, Neil had already mentioned most of these, so this is a great introduction. So, um, so the pest issues we do see um, are quite a bit different than what we see in the field. Um, there's, you know, obviously no rain or overhead irrigation when you're in a tunnel or a greenhouse. Um, so that means we don't have some of the rain splash diseases like anthracnose. We have actually seen very little gray mold. That may be because in, in our trials, we've kept things, you know, very cleanly picked. Um, and so we haven't really seen those issues so much. Some on raspberries, but, but not on the strawberries um, so much. And then we see more of the problems, and these are ones that rainfall helps to control. Um, and so the ones that rainfall does help to control become worse in a tunnel um, or, or you know, in a greenhouse as well. So powdery mildew, a lot of the smaller insect pests, which we think of as greenhouse pests, so the aphids, um, you know, mites, thrips, um, all those sorts of things. So I do just want to mention too that when you do get into pest issues, um, you know the the materials that you might use, um, you need to be um, aware of the fact that the pesticides will need to be labeled for um, for either greenhouse um, production or it may say protected culture systems or protected culture production or um, sometimes high tunnels are mentioned on the label as well. Um, the way it works in Pennsylvania, and I'm not sure about other states, but it's defined that if the structure is big enough that you actually get in it to work, um, then it counts as some sort of protected culture. And so the labeling has to be, um, have, has to have wording on it that it allows it to be used um, in that situation. So we're going to talk about some of the diseases we see first. So powdery mildew. Um, was, was one, you know, we'd already mentioned. Um, and so that one, when, you know, when you don't have rain, um, you know, you'll, you'll tend to see more, more issues with it, or at least more symptoms on the fruit, um, because the spores um, can be washed off by, by the rain. And um, also just the environment with warm temperatures and higher humidity or conditions of powdery mildew really likes, so um, tends to become a bigger problem. And then um, we do find too that our day neutral varieties are susceptible to, um, to powdery mildew. And um, as they're coming out of, you know, mostly coming out of California now, the one um, 
that we are using where the conditions tend to be drier and they don't have you know as much resistance as some of our eastern cultivars and seascape is one that is really susceptible um, we haven't seen this on on brambles in pennsylvania so far and these are some photos of seascape from a grower tunnel where the plants were grown in a gutter system. Um, and they were um, very um, packed in there pretty tightly. And so we did see um, some issues with that. Um, we've also seen it um, on, well, seascape, but also in a, in a greenhouse setup that is just a small scale one um, in, in Pennsylvania. And so the um, things that are important for management are to increase ventilation and airflow as much as possible. We may be fortunate in that on both of our research sites, we have very windy conditions. Um, and so we haven't seen that much in a way of problems lately. Early on, um, we had seen some issues and we did use um, a biofungicide um, called AQ10. I believe there were some, um, was a trial done in New York with cucurbits. Um, where it seemed to work for powdery mildew on that as well. I think that was a detached leaf study though. This was on actual plants. We only used it one time, so we don't really have a lot, you know, to compare it, <laughs> anything to compare it to really. So that was just an observation. Um, our, one of our plant pathologists will say, you know, if you have problems, you can, you can help wash the spores off from the leaves if you use water. Um, I do wanna warn folks that I do know of one grower who had used um, a potassium bicarbonate product. Um, he was actually trying to control mites, but potassium bicarbonate is for powdery mildew um, and works on powdery mildew. But when he applied it under high temperature conditions, um, the raspberries fell off of his leaves in a high tunnel. So I don't know if that's something that would happen very, very frequently, but just want you to be aware of that. And another disease we see is late leaf rust. This is not a systemic rust, so it's not like you need to pull the plants out to to um, take care of the problem. Um, some spruce trees are an alternate host on this one, but once it gets on the raspberries, it can persist. Um, historically, it's mainly been a problem for red raspberries, but we know black raspberries can be affected too. And so we've seen an onjol, um, a niwot, and a tunnel. Um, mainly we've seen it on the leaves and it has it has affected some of the fruit, but it hasn't been a big enough problem yet to, to worry about treating it when we were in a tunnel, tunnel situation. We saw it more so out in the field though, on the fruit. And then I wanna mention this is one that hopefully you can see what we're looking at here. Um, the contrast in this photo is kind of tough, but um, Cladosporium, um, we see this on raspberries. There are two different species that cause it. And so it has some um, a velvety green growth will show up on it. And so um, hopefully you can see my, my cursor here, but um, what we're looking at is sometimes it'll be on the receptacles and some that are just hanging out there. So it's sort of a velvety green color right here. And you can also see one fruit that we had missed that was affected by it back here. So you might think that would be gray mold, but that was actually cladosporium. And then sometimes folks will see that there are just little splotches around the rim of the raspberry, which you're not seeing on this one here, but what it is caused by is that sometimes the anthers get infected by it. And then if you have moist conditions and they lay on the fruit, you get these little splotches of cladosporium um, around the rim of the berry. And those are really just on the surface, but they still affect the um, marketability. In fact, the disease itself tends to be just on the surface and it can be um, rubbed off actually. So anyway, so that's one that we do see um, oh, in, in tunnels occasionally. It is a common um, fungus in the environment. It's just one of those things that's sort of around and it doesn't, didn't normally cause problems in the past. But part of the reason we think we might be seeing it now um, is that it is associated with spotted wing drosophila and it, it can be in its digestive tract and it may be um, that when spotted wing drosophila is um, moving around or feeding on fruit or um, ovipositing, it might be introducing it through the surface. Um, you know, there could be multiple avenues where that is um, affecting the fact that we're seeing it more. So, um, so it's worst under high humidity tends to be worse, or worse in the fall when um, we have short days and reduced light and less drying. 
So we, um, at this point, we just recommend trying to ventilate more and keeping the fruit picked and then trying to control spotawing Drosophila as much as you can, which we will, um, which we will talk about also. So, um, so now we're going to move into the insects. So um, with spotted wing drosophila, you know, we typically don't think of it as being a huge problem in the northeast on our June bearing strawberries because um, generally by the time the populations build, we just don't see, um, you know, we don't see very much, much of it and we're through the strawberry season. But with day neutrals, either in the field or in tunnels, sometimes, um, or if with very late season June bearing cultivars, folks will notice that there are light soft spots um, on the fruit. Now that can be mistaken for sun scald, but if you're seeing it on the, you know, on the um, shady side of the row, um, it's probably not. Um, or um, they will mention that it seems to them that the fruit is melting. And then this tends to become worse in the fall because that's when the populations have built the highest. And so when that happens, um, you know, you can kind of tell yourself that it must just have been the rain <laughs> in the field or something like that. And maybe you don't want to look too close, but um, when, one thing I've learned over the years is that looking at what you're going to eat under a microscope is always a bad idea. But anyway, so what we um, see here in this picture on the left, and this was taken under a microscope, is a strawberry. Um, you can tell that the color of, of the fruit is a little bit off. It's a little pinker, you know, than, it, than a normal ripe berry would be. So this is a soft area. And if you look at it, what you see is actually an egg. And then, um, you know, they're, they're um, are, are basically, you know, breathing tubes. And so on this, so right here is where the egg is. And you can see that under the surface of the fruit where it has been inserted. And then over on the right um, is an larvae in the fruit. And so what you see are, are, are basically, um, you know, how, how, it, how it gets its air um, with this little appendage up here in the air. And you can kind of see right along here, the outline um, of, of the larvae itself. And so it goes right through here. And so, um, so that's just something that, you know, we need to be aware of, we can have issues with. And then typically spotted wing will be a bigger problem in brambles. And so again, under the microscope, this is blackberry where you can see a number of um, eggs have been laid in these individual droplets. And right over here is an egg um, that you can see just underneath the surface. And then this is where the fruit is softened and um, the skin was rubbed off and you see the larvae right here. So not, you know, not what we wanna see. And then generally, um, if the, um, when, when the spotted wing goes through pupitation, you will see a pupa. Typically these will drop to the ground, but here's one that is in a raspberry fruit. So anyway, so adults will tend to um, hide out. This is in a tunnel where they're on the underside of the berry. We were hoping with part of a trial that maybe we could find out whether we could use a plastic that would tend to you know, make the population, um, the population's not want, want to move into the tunnel so much, which we did very much see with Japanese beetle. Um, but with spotted wing, what we found was if we had a U ultraviolet light transmitting plastic, so something like tough light four, we did see lower adult, adult populations, but each adult lies, lays so many eggs that it just didn't make any difference in the larval numbers by the time it was all said and done. So, so that one didn't work. But so we've yet to find a solution. Now it can exclude with netting. Um, we do have some issues where the tunnels will tend to get pretty warm in Pennsylvania, and so the mites will multiply faster. Do recommend harvesting frequently, um, using good sanitation, work at the University of Maryland. Um, show that using landscape fabric can help so that you don't miss fruit. And trust and pyganic are a couple of options. Um, and there is some movement towards some upcoming parasitoid releases. So that may be a longer term solution for us. And then I wanna talk about mites. So numbers can really you know, explode under a tunnel. Um, two spotted spider mites, which you see on our left are, are a common one, which tend to lay a lot of eggs. 
Sometimes we've had some issues with broad mites. I just want to point out with them, you need high magnification. Um, this floral um, and fluorescence here is, is really compressed. And um, that was a symptom of broad mites. And then this is what an egg looks like um, down here at the bottom, um, where it's kind of a, a speckled looking egg, but you need a microscope to see that. We haven't seen issues with cyclamen mites yet um, or um, carmen mites, which are um, actually just a color variation of two spotted spider mite, but they could, um, they brought in on nursery stock, so we could see those as well. So we um, would release predators and they always seem to work for um, two spotted spider mite unless we um, refrigerated them, which I'm talking. Carol Glenister, she said, no, you're supposed to keep them cool, not cold. And so once we stopped doing that, um, that, that solved that problem. And then sometimes we would try to hold them overnight or you know, for an extra day if we didn't release them right away. Um, and that was a no-no also. So this is what a predatory mite looks like. You can see right here, um, moving, moving around. Um, looking for mites. So if you want to release predators, you'll need to um, talk to your supplier, um, be prepared for information on the size of the area you wanna treat, um, how big your problem is, um, what your temperature and humidity ranges are, and they can make a recommendation for what you can, what you can use. And they may recommend reducing the populations first with you know, spraying the plants with water or using insecticidal scope, um, soap. Um, there is a good website also at Cornell on um, biocontrols and predators that has a lot of great information on it. So if we released early, we would use a combination of um, Neosulis phalasis and Californicus that gives longer term control. So would we release that one? We'd just see a few leaves that were looking like this with a little bit of stippling. That worked well for longer term control. And then if we had a really big outbreak when we weren't paying attention, um, we were able to get this one under control. This, not every plant looked like this, but we um, used Phytosolus um, persimilis, um, but that gets really expensive when you try to release enough mites to clean something like that up. So thrips, um, here's a thrip feeding on a, or thrips feeding on a strawberry, and you can see why it causes the bronzing because there is surface damage. Um, that it's causing there. And um, so that, that bronzing is a problem on strawberries. Um, sometimes it can cause the seeds to lift off if the um, fruit surface doesn't, it can't expand enough because of damage. Um, powdery mildew can cause the same thing. And you'll notice this, if you notice the seeds falling off, look, you can look for one of the two of those. And then just the fact that they're around on raspberries and, is an issue. And then aphids um, is another concern. This is just an aph um, aphid population actually on a sow thistle. But you can also see a wasp here <laughs> that, that was parasitizing some of the um, aphids and there's a parasitized one right there. And so what worked well, we, we didn't really have issues at Rock Springs, but there we always had a population of lace wings and hoverflies. Um, the larvae on them are predaceous, and the, so we've never used pesticides in like 20 years in our high tunnel environment, and so we think we've just built up a good population of, of these beneficials. We did have issues um, in Landisville, which is their southeast research station, and so what we did there was we knocked them back with insecticidal soap. Um, with several sprays of that. And then we moved some potted sweet alyssum into the tunnel um, to attract beneficials and that seemed to help. So typically our growers will keep um, these products on hand to try to knock things back if they need to quickly and trust pyganic and insecticidal soap. And that's you know, all we'll mention there. But I do just want to say too, to you know, we need to keep our pollinators in mind when we're applying anything. And I do just want to mention this is a black raspberry. This hole in the end of the cane is actually a solitary bee egg chamber. There are eggs in this in this cane. They like a hollow, soft um, center to, um, you know, to to a cane or a piece of wood or cardboard tube. And that's not a hole made by a bee. So I just wanted folks to be aware. So it looks like we're right at 10 o'clock, Laura. Do we just wanna do questions in the chat or how do you wanna handle this? Um, why don't we take a question or two if we have them? I think there was um, something about 
uh, spider-wing drosophila fly an issue during August and September in high tunnel? I think we know the answer to that. Mm, yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So does yep. anybody else have another question regarding pest management or just general um, container issues right now? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so question, how can you tell the difference between the bee egg chamber and the borer hole? So, um, so these will always be in the very tip of the cane. And so what I will tell folks is to cut that cane about six or eight inches down. And if it doesn't go any further than that, then it's not a bore. Most, you know, our pest bores will ten, tunnel further down in the cane, and some of them will even get into the crown area. And then if if it, you know, if it doesn't go any further than that, then you know it is just a, a bee egg chamber, and you can just let that hang out somewhere in your tunnel there that's safe, so that they can hatch out. So why don't I quickly um, just introduce, I'm gonna share my screen as well, but I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Kathy, so much. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, which Kathy also introduced me to, and that is Mark McDonald. He started the Bee Tree Berry Farm in Belafonte, Pennsylvania in 2012 with a small plot of strawberries, which has now grown to 20 acres of sustainably cultivated berries and vegetables. Well, good morning and, and, and thanks for having me. A um, little background about, about Laura and myself. Uh, we've only been farming now for 10 years. Uh, we got started a little, little later in life that, uh, than a lot of folks have. Uh, I spent 32 years growing golf turf um, and Laura spent some time um, working in a greenhouse um, at, a, at a farm market in, in York County. So we do have a little bit of growing background. Um, I, and like you said, we do have 20 acres uh, that we planted with mixed berries and uh, some vegetable crops, a few fruit trees, and uh, a couple of chickens. Um, our sales, uh, they all happen uh, at two farmers markets. We have a, a small CSA, and we also do uh, you pick um, strawberries, blueberries, and elderberries. Um, one thing that we noticed early on when we were first starting uh, our, our first couple of years growing strawberries was the uh, just how everyone everyone wanted them and, and they just couldn't get enough. Um, so we were looking for ways to extend that season. And uh, we went into uh, our first day neutral, uh, third of an acre planting on plastic uh, in 2014, I believe. And, and we tried to grow on plastic uh, for about four years. And um, with organic inputs, uh, it made it very difficult to control the anthracnose primarily. Um, found it very hard to, to have a, a, a good harvestable crop to take to market on a weekly basis. So with that, uh, we actually went to see Kathy one, uh, I think it was October, um, probably of 2017 maybe. And uh, we went to look at her low tunnel production. And, and while we were there, uh, she showed us what was going on in the high tunnels, and that really intrigued us. Um, so we started the next spring uh, with some uh, um, high tunnel production, and uh, you can see here that our, our first year we were growing um, in bags uh, on the ground. And uh, we also had some raspberries um, in the background there as well. Um, we were growing Albion in, in one gallon bags. And this is just a two by four frame with some, with some uh, fencing on it to support the bags. And those bags are uh, 12 to 14 inches on center. So, uh, we also had 30 raspberries in the back there. Uh, they were grown in uh, 
three gallon pots. Again, with, with holes, drainage holes in them and, and uh, everything was fed with a 2720 from Nutriculture. And uh, again, this was due to our high alkalinity water that we had to deal with. So uh, our, our growing mix was uh, the, two, the two to one peat to perlite. And uh, you can see here, this is our, our initial, this is probably our, our first week of, of uh, planting. Uh, typically we'll get our, our plants the first week of April and try to get them in the ground within 10 days of receiving. So uh, we'll stick them in the, on, our, on our benches, which you can see now are, are now raised. Um, and you can see we're growing uh, strictly strawberries in this tunnel now. Uh, the raspberries are, are out. Uh, we actually divided them up and, and put them out in the field a couple of years ago. So we used the pots that the, straw, the raspberries were in and raised the benches. Um, which was a, a nice aspect um, to makes picking a little easier. You're still bent over a little bit, but you're not crawling on the ground, which is kind of nice. Um, let's see. So yeah, you can and also you can see now we're growing in pots in the, in the one gallon trade pots as opposed to the one gallon bags. Uh, our first two years we grew. In the, in, in the white bags with the black, uh, white on black bag. And uh, didn't like the, con the fact that we had to throw everything away. So we're, we've gone to the black pots um, for two years now. And uh, it seems to be working out okay. Uh, we're actually gonna split it again this year. I'm gonna go 50-50 with the, with the white bags to the black pots. and try and get dialed in as to what really works best for us. Uh, Cause we're still, again, we're, this will be our, our fifth season and we still have a lot to learn. Um, uh, I guess the biggest problem that we've had uh, other than, than crawling along the ground to, to pick. And again, we've eliminated that with uh, raising the pots. Um, we did, we have had some powdery mildew issues and uh, a little bit of thrip problem. Um, nothing major, nothing really, really crazy, but uh, enough to have an impact on our harvest. Um, and fertility, our, uh, our irrigation water is, is uh, really not up to the standards that we'd like. Um, so we do have to really pay attention to, to how we're feeding. Um, our harvests, our, our uh, I guess our first year data, we didn't really have any, any real uh, information on our first year harvest. Um, in 2018, uh, 2019, uh, we had a uh, 1,046 marketable pints. And I, I need to mention that uh, we do have, we have 700 pots. So, uh, we were getting, that was about 732 pounds uh, our first year. Uh, that was an average of, of, of uh, 0.7 pounds per, per pint, uh, which is how we, we measure our, our yield because uh, we, we do sell by the pint. Um, so I see a question about plant runners. Um, we basically, when they get in my way, uh, going down the aisles if, if they're if they're if i'm tripping over them which will happen uh, later in the season um i remove them uh, we do go through once and, and and pick the first flowers uh and we do one major uh cutting of of runners uh early on in the season but after that we pretty much let them go and again unless they're they're in our way then we uh, take care of them but um uh, so our second, our second year on these raised benches and uh, in the black pots, we changed our mix uh, away from the, the uh, peat perlite mix that had been recommended. And we went with uh, 
a, a, a bag mix BK25. And uh, follow the same fertility programs, the same planting programs, et cetera. And uh, our yield increased um, from a pound per plant to 1.3 pounds per plant. So, you know, again, we're getting, uh, I got 1,273 marketable pints out of this little, this little thousand square feet, 1,100 square feet of, of uh, growing space, which, you know, it, it, it's not a lot of, of, of uh, poundage, but when you're, when you're looking at uh, the return on investment, um, you know, we were, we were able to get $6 a pint uh, at market um, for, our, for our day neutrals. And uh, that's, that's a pretty good, I think that's a pretty good return uh, for a thousand square, a little over a thousand square feet of, of growing space. Um, last year, we had a, a little issue. Again, we went back to peat perlite um, and we, we harvested uh, 155 pounds last year. Um, we actually turned the water off in uh, early September because of just, uh, there was no flower production um, late mid season on. We had some, this is, this is uh, last year, we had a little bit of fruit early and some flower production early. And uh, as the season went on, uh, our flower production basically stopped. Uh, so we just couldn't see the, the need to continue with it last year. So uh, we have ordered plants again for this year, uh, Albion again. Uh, our thoughts are to go on um, back with the BK25 and uh, again, I wanna split it up with, with uh, the bags versus the pots, keep up with the same fertility program um, and see where it takes us. Uh, something else we're thinking about doing this year is uh, putting up a small caterpillar uh, tunnel and uh, growing day neutrals directly in soil under plastic. Uh, we're still debating what to do with that. Um, so um, I guess our I guess I can answer any questions uh, if you have if you have any, uh, please. Thanks, Mark. That was great. And there are some questions in the chat box, and um, I don't know if you guys are if I'm sharing everything or what I'm sharing actually. But um, there was a question from Chuck Mead about flavor and firmness, comparing greenhouse uh, and tunnel versus the field fruit. Did you have any comments on that? Yeah, uh, like like uh, Neil was saying earlier, um, the the early berries in the tunnel um, really are 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 not up to the the field flavor. Uh, so if you can continue to grow throughout the, in, in the field a little later, maybe with uh, Malvina or something like that, uh, it'll get you into at least a a time where the tunnel berries start to pick up in flavor. Really mid-August, you really notice a big change uh, in, in the flavor. And, and once, once mid-August, September get there, uh, they're probably the best berries flavor-wise that we have all, all season. Great, thank you. And then you talked about the plant runners and then Mike Knuckles, this is actually uh, close to what you were just saying, the harvest season start and stopping. When, what is your like average starting and average stopping in the in the tunnel. Well, again, we'll start when berries are present. We'll harvest them. Uh, so we'll start harvesting in June, late third week, fourth week of June, and uh, we've gone as far as Thanksgiving. It all it all depends on the year, basically. And now, obviously, the yields uh, early and later are are small. Um, our biggest. I'm trying to see uh, August and September typically are our, our best months for harvest for the uh, biggest yield, but um, we do have berries available. Uh, I've taken them to farmers market to, till the middle of middle of November. Great. Um, Jim has a question about changes with the media. Just wondering if you've finally if you've settled on something that you really like or 
you're just kind of still experimenting. Yeah, I'm, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, we actually did a little work with Kathy last year. Uh, she was doing a, a media study uh, at Landisville and uh, we did a few uh, pots here as well with the same products. And unfortunately our, our yields last year just didn't work out uh, because of our flowering issue. But um, there was a core product uh, that our plants look good growing in it. Um, I, I'm going to talk, uh, I want to get some information uh, hopefully uh, on how their yields were down at, at their research farm um, and go from there. But right now I think we're going to stick with BK25 unless we, we see some good information coming out of, the, out of their study. All right, great. Um, if before we answer the last two questions, I, I'm wondering if um, Andy or Natasha could put the uh, link to the DEC credit survey, which uh, folks have to do that at the end of the session and in order to get the DEC credits, but we can keep talking about some of these questions. And we have a question about any problem with kinking of the fruit trusses. Kinking of the fruit trusses, not uh, not something we've experienced. No. Okay, that that has been a problem um, for some people that they will sit on that uh, edge of the pot, and they can, you know, just because of weight of the fruit or the sharpness of the edge, provide a little kink, and it kind of shuts off everything to that fruit um, as it grows. So. That is something to be aware of. I was going to say we've we've seen that in some of our greenhouse strawberries, and so we've ended up moving to this trough that has a smooth kind of curved edge, um, and that helps. And then otherwise, I've seen some growers um, run tape, not sticky tape, but like uh, um, uh, raised up a little bit so they can they can position the trusses kind of resting on that soft uh, tape. And Laura, can, can I jump in with a few things too? So, um, so first on the fruit trusses, yeah, so helping keep the media a little higher will, can help with that too. If that settles into the pots, then the trusses are up and then they're bending over. So, so that's one thing that can help. Um, and that's part of the reason that we are still with the bags is just they just sort of, <laughs> you know, fold down. Um, as far as the low yields, I... I was having some conversations with Marv Pritz and also Kim Lures at Landisville or Landisville, Beltsville. For some reason, they were seeing really high denu or Yeah, they were seeing less flowering last year. We didn't really have that problem at Landisville, so we have no idea what's going on. It seemed very hit or miss, and so I don't, I don't know what what was going on there. You know. Um, with Mark's because we, I think we had the same plant source. And so that was really baffling. Um, and then when it, and out of our trial at Landisville, so what worked really well as far as the media goes um, is um, it's called BC5++. It's actually the media they're using in Ontario and the Netherlands. And it's a very different mix. That one worked really well for us, better than anything else we had tried. Um, the two to one P per light um, was really at the bottom um, for in that trial. Other ones did better. We tried a five, other, five other ones, but that BC5 then was the sixth one and that one did the best. Um, and then the other thing is that with some, um, we're working with folks at the Hershey School, they've actually moved to using a petunia feed, which provides a lot more iron. That helps. There's also another new fertilizer out of ICO, I think it is, that has a lot more iron and micronutrients and in forms that are available at higher pHs if you get into issues. So next year, we're going to be looking at some of our best media with our best fertilizers and um try to get a better handle on that so we can hopefully, you know, answer these questions. That's great. And I know uh, William has a question that doesn't look like a very quick question, but possibly um, your what is your fertility program? And I want to say while uh, Mark is formulating an answer for that, I would like to encourage people, we don't have a formal evaluation, which is, is my oversight. <laughs> However, I would, we, we're going to try to put something together. But if you have a thought while you're sitting here thinking about these um, questions, please put 
topics that you would like. It, for instance, if you want to see more in-depth information on container culture, now's the time to tell us so that we can try to uh, follow up on that. But uh, Mark, I don't know if you can do that uh, question justice in a, a minute or two about the fertility program? Our, ours is really simple. Uh, basically, we'll, we'll start the year with, with uh, the plant marvel 2720 uh, for high alkalinity soil or, or water and, and stick with it. Um, if we have an issue, I'll add a little, uh, take uh, something with a little manganese and, and iron in it uh, to take care of some, some chlor chlorotic looking issues. But other than that, um that's that's pretty much it for us pretty simple great well thank you i i don't want to cut this short but we're about seven minutes over our time to adjourn i really want to thank our speakers um it's a this is something that growers are always asking me about and i'm really happy we have expertise and uh a uh, grower that's willing to share um, you know what's going on there so thank you so much everyone we will this has been a production of cornell university on the web at cornell.edu